Good afternoon. I can you can do better. All right, I really want everybody to quiet down now. You've had a, a lunch. We've launched this Take Back America 08 conference that is really going to take back our country. And I want your attention now because our, our subject is the economy. Please, if you're still networking and talking, take it outside. We're talking about the economy at a moment in history when the conservative economic policy chickens are coming home to roost. Every day, the front page headlines and unfolding details on the worried business pages tell the story. Even those who made a killing only a few weeks ago are worried. The collapse of Bear Stearns and the Carlisle Group are just the tip of the iceberg. After several decades of conservative economic and tax policy that favored only the super wealthy and not productive investment, multiple bubbles are popping and deflating. The housing and mortgage bubble, the hedge fund bubble, the financial bubble. And the global economy is just beginning a painful process of working itself out of this daisy chain of financial speculation. Economist Paul Krugman the other day told us we're in what looks like one of history's great financial crises. Millions of Americans are losing their family homes. The Wall Street Journal's panelist of economists just announced that we're in a recession. And the real impacts of this unraveling crisis are very hard to predict. But one thing we can tell for sure, it won't be good for working families who will lose their jobs, lose their health care, lose their incomes. It's our job to make sure that out of this economic crisis, it won't be good for conservative politicians who got us here. Clearly, the 2008 election debate is going to be dominated by those who can explain what is going on, who can give our country a clear explanation of how we got into this mess and, and who's to blame, and who can lay out bold solutions to solve the housing crisis, to get us out of a potentially deep recession, and uh, create good American jobs and healthy growth based on producing useful goods and services and energy that is renewable. Progressives win when we unite the country around a bold vision of economic prosperity. And we have several great speakers who are going to well equipped to talk to you about how to boldly respond to this crisis. Now, first, I want to present a leader from our neighbor to the north. The Canadians did not deregulate the mortgage markets like we did, but like the rest of the world, they're going to have to deal with the results of U.S. conservative stupidity. One of the reasons the Canadian government is more progressive in general, one of the reasons they have health care for every single Canadian right now, today, <laughs> is that they have the new Democrat the, the new Democratic Party in Canada. And that party is now led by Jack Layton. Jack was a progressive government leader in Toronto. He runs an award-winning green business. And if the progressive winds that are blowing in the US also catch on in Canada, Jack Layton could be Canada's next prime minister. To give us his greetings, please welcome NDP leader Jack Layton. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roger, and th dear friends, uh, sisters and brothers, it's a, a thrill and an honor for, for me to be here with all of you. And uh, I want to start just by uh, uh, expressing my thanks for this wonderful meal, the wonderful hospitality, the terrific service that we've had from the hardworking people uh, in this hotel. Uh, it's, um, I'm joined here by my member of parliament. Uh, her name is Olivia Chow, and uh, I don't mind saying she's the best member of parliament in the House of Commons, because she's also my wife. Yeah. 
and every speech I give has uh, copious notes added and changes made by my closest political advisor, Olivia. Uh, she also is responsible for commenting on issues having to do with, uh, with immigration uh, and refugees in our country and is also the champion of a, an initiative we're bringing forward which, which is to provide universal, affordable, high quality child care for every child in Canada coast to coast to coast. So it's true, uh, I do come from Canada. It's, uh, it's cold up there, and uh, we want to keep it that way, which is why we're fighting climate change the way we are. I mean, how are we going to continue to produce the greatest hockey players uh, in the world uh, if, uh, if we don't have ice? Um, I did want to clarify a couple of things about our party. Uh, we are the New Democratic Party, but for those of you, uh, f of course, immersed in politics here, don't get us confused with uh, uh, DLC. Uh, we, we, are, we are the progressive party in Canada. It's true that uh, picking up on a, an inspirational statement that was made by one of your great leaders from whom we draw inspiration so often, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, when he said that of all the injustices, uh, inequality of health care is the most shocking and the most inhumane. And that fundamental proposition motivated my predecessor, Tommy Douglas, uh, who became the Premier of Saskatchewan, to bring in the first universal health care program anywhere in North America in the 1940s, and we ex have extended it to the entire country now, and we commend it to your attention in your uh, debates because it's based on five principles. Universality, comprehensiveness, portability, accessibility, and it's public uh, publicly administered, and it also shares something in common with uh, progressive health measures that you've worked ho so hard to create, it's under, under attack by the privatizers and uh, the multinational health corporations at all times. And so uh, we're waging a furious battle in Canada right now, not only to protect our health care system uh, as a public system, but to extend it to include the medications that our doctors say that we need uh, to deal with the issues our families are facing. We want national pharmacare in Canada uh, as the next step. But you know, uh, so many of our experiences in, in Canada reflect yours, uh, and that's no surprise. We have the world's longest undefended border between our two countries. We conduct $500 billion of trade together each year. It's a phenomenal uh, uh, relationship. And as I said, we are inspired so often by your leaders and, and by your movements. And I can say we're inspired right now watching the political process unfold uh, here in your country. Of course, we've also mourned with you at very difficult times throughout our our history, uh, the attacks of 9-11, the, the Katrina uh, controversy and the, and the horrors that happened there uh, and the way in which that uh, unfolded. Uh, I am very proud to say that our party was the first in our country to stand up and say uh, that invading Iraq would not be a solution that should be pursued as a response to what we see happening. And in fact, our countries aren't just neighbors, we are really true friends. And I've always believed that we should nurture that friendship, progressive to progressive, because united we could accomplish a great deal together. Now, um, I'm really here to speak about one of the areas where we must work together. And it has to do with the growing gap which is occurring in our societies as a result of the way we are structuring, and I say we, I really mean they are restructuring our trade and economic relationships in a fashion that is fundamentally unfair, that is leaving millions and millions of people behind, that is not sustainable, and that ultimately benefits the very, very few and the multinational corporate interests that promote this kind of trade. An example, of course, is NAFTA, which has reached the news headlines recently. But NAFTA is only important because it actually represents 
a structure of trading relationships which is now being trumpeted as the way in which the world economy should be permitted to develop. And I simply want to say we must not let it develop in that fashion. We must let it develop for working people who make up the economy, no matter what country we're talking about. Let me tell you that in Canada, people are working longer and harder each and every day. A study was done by one of our progressive economic uh, groups, very similar to the groups that have put this organization together uh, over your years of a successful meeting. We found that Canadians are, and the average Canadian family is working 250 hours more per year, the equivalent of five additional full-time weeks of work, and yet they're not earning any more money. In fact, in many cases, they're slipping backwards. They're having less time with their family. They're more stressed. They have second and third jobs. They can't pay the rent at the end of the month. They're using their credit cards to pay their mortgages, and they are feeling left out of the so-called economic boom that characterized recent years in our country. Now, this is unfair and wrong because it's their hard work that builds the economy and allows the profits such as they are uh, to be achieved by our banks and our oil companies. Nearly two-thirds of Canadians, when you ask them, will tell you we're not benefiting by, by what's going on in the economy today. In fact, our families are finding it tougher and tougher, and half of Canadians today will tell you that they think they're one or two paychecks away from not being able to pay the rent or the mortgage. And that, for any family, is called living on the edge, and it shouldn't be happening. People who thought that they were comfortable, who imagined a better life for their children, who described themselves as middle class, are now finding themselves incredibly squeezed and really paying a price. Add to that the anxieties about climate change and what that holds for the next generation or the generation after that. These are deep anxieties. The costs of health care that are rising, particularly those parts that aren't covered by our Medicare program in Canada, like prescription drugs. The costs of education, skyrocketing tuition, student debt, these kinds of issues that are weighing on families and really denying kids and young people a future before they even get started. So this is why Canadians are becoming uh, more anxious and yet they look out and they see some people doing so well. We have one bank that got involved, overexposed itself to the sub uh, mortgage, subprime mortgage situation here and uh, had to write down a considerable amount of hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, that bank CEO was rewarded by a, a $9 million bonus. How one would, I just try to think of how many workers on an assembly line would get a bonus uh, for performance that resembled anything like that. In fact, our workers are working longer and harder and doing very well, but then they get thrown out of work when unfair trade deals result in their jobs being lost. That's not right. And it's not right that the top 100 CEOs in my country make 218 times more than the average Canadian. Uh, they earn in the first nine hours and 33 minutes of January the 1st what the average Canadian makes in an entire year. This kind of inequality has got to be addressed, and there are so many solutions to help us address them. I was just blown away by Van Jones' uh, remarks this morning about green jobs and how we can retrofit and renovate and weatherize our, our buildings from one end of the country to the other. And our party is advocating that we take every building in Canada and renovate it from top to bottom and pay for it out of the energy, the oil, and the gas that we don't have to purchase and create jobs everywhere in Canada. And uh, that's the kind of vision that you share. But I have to say that the recent controversy about NAFTA uh, certainly has us concerned. But I want to say to uh, Senators Obama and Clinton, we are pleased that you raised the issue of the need to reform those trade deals to make them more fair, to establish labor standards that really work, to establish environmental standards that really work. And you have Canadians on your side and ready to work with you as we reach across the border to build fair and sustainable trade. In fact, I wrote to the senators the moment they spoke out uh, and said that we have an historic opportunity here to build across the border a movement of working people for the kind of society that our kids dream of and hope to construct. My friends, uh, 
I simply want to close by saying to have the opportunity to be with progressive Americans is inspiring to me. What's going on here and across your great country as you rethink the direction that has been followed in recent years, it, it parallels what we're doing in our country. And I want to bring to you that message of hope from millions of Canadians who wish you well in your project of building a new future. And we want to be part, working with you, of building a new future for all people on this planet. I believe we can get it done. Don't let them tell you it can't be done. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, mes chers amis. Thank you, Jack Layton. We're going to be hearing a lot more about Jack Layton in years to come. Uh, Robert Kuttner has been sounding the alarm for years now in important books like Everything for Sale, The Virtues and Limits of Markets, and The Economic Illusion, The False Choice Between Prosperity and Social Justice. Kuttner has been warning how opportunistic right-wing politics was combining with Wall Street greed to undermine and destabilize our real economy. I urge you to get his new book, The Squandering of America, How the Failure of Our Politics Undermines Our Prosperity. It explains step by step how the conservatives dismantled the basic powers the government used to use to assure economic stability and transparency. And today he's gonna to give us a blueprint, a new set of rules for restabilizing what desperately needs to be restabilized, and reviving global capitalism so it produces economic progress for all instead of irresponsible windfalls for the wealthy and the financial elites. Please welcome founding co-editor of the American Prospect, Robert Kuttner. Thank you, Roger. Uh, it's uh, great to be in a room with 2,000 American progressives. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm very pessimistic about the economy. I'm very optimistic about the politics. Uh, our economy now faces the most serious financial crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, we know how to save capitalism from itself. We've done it before. Uh, we understand the economics. It's up to us to rebuild the politics. Uh, as I wrote in uh, The Squandering of America, the crisis that we're facing has three basic sources. The first is the speculative ruin of financial markets caused by speculation and the spillover onto the real economy. The second source is the stagnation of family incomes because of the gutting of all of the social counterweights to pure markets. And the third is a trade policy that puts the interests of elites over the interests of our country. The financial crisis should signal once and for all that the 30-year experiment in market fundamentalism is a practical failure. Behind, <laughs> behind all of these economic failures is a failure of politics, a failure of opposition politics, to offer a practical alternative that speaks to the lived lives of Americans. Let me take each of the three aspects of the economic crisis in turn. First of all, financial elites with far too much political influence over both political parties uh, gutted the regulatory system that embodied all that we learned from the Great Depression. Reaping huge windfalls from quickie speculative deals, they insisted that something new about the economy meant that Markets could regulate themselves after all. People who challenged that conventional wisdom were d dismissed as either radical or even worse, uh, as out of date and, and not understanding the new economy. Ask Ben Bernanke if he thinks markets can regulate themselves. Uh, ask Alan Greenspan. Greenspan, you know, wrote a whole memoir. Uh, the first half disparaged government the second half recounted all of the ways that the Federal Reserve had rescued Wall Street from itself, almost as if the old man had forgotten that the Federal Reserve is part of the government. If the Fed simply let markets, left markets to their own devices, if uh, the Fed were not there with its bailing bucket, cutting rates, cutting deals, pouring in money, breaking every rule of monetary discipline, every money center bank would be insolvent. 
And instead of being uh, down 1,000 points, the Dow would be down several thousand points. Uh, and uh, unemployment would be through the roof. Uh, Bear Stearns, recently trading at $70 a share, was just unloaded onto J.P. Morgan Chase at a fire sale price of two bucks a share. If you let markets work and uh, mark down all their assets to the trading price, uh, it's 1929 uh, all over again. The second problem is that for 30 years, the income of ordinary Americans has been stagnant. Jobs have become more precarious. Good jobs have become harder to find. And if you count the fact that the average family is having to work uh, not 250 hours more a year as in Canada, but 500 hours uh, more a year, uh, then most American households have suffered a real decline uh, in their living standards. This is a special problem for young Americans who did not buy a house 30 years ago, who did not go to college debt-free as my generation did, and who did not get into jobs that automatically came with good health insurance. It's an even more serious problem for young Americans who do not have affluent families to underwrite private welfare states, and that's most young Americans. Now, there's an instructive uh, connection between cause number one, Wild West banking, and cause number two, sinking incomes. And that link is the fact that the speculative financial economy has been all too happy to step in and help ordinary people compensate for their declining purchasing power by lending them money, often at extortionate rates. And so for more than a decade, credit card debt, student loans, subprime, home equity withdrawals, medical debt have served as stand-ins for declining wages. For the first five years of this decade, home equity withdrawals accounted for more than 5% of consumer purchasing power. But with the collapse of the housing bubble, the defaults on credit card loans, the epidemic of household bankruptcy, this strategy is no longer viable, either for American families or for the economy as a whole. The working family is simply tapped out. And now it's increasingly clear that the illusion of American prosperity uh, has been built largely on asset bubbles. Exotic securities created by Wall Street based on loans that overstated the value of the collateral, based on uh, fantastic views of the ability of the borrower uh, to pay back the money. And when the whole cycle went into reverse, markets froze. Uh, that's why the Fed can't fix what's broken, either with cheaper rates or with shotgun mergers, unless the Fed simply wants to nationalize the banks. The third factor leading to this crisis is trade policy. Uh, America, in a sense, has stopped exporting enough products to pay for what it imports, and instead our two main exports are toxic financial uh, products and uh, free market ideology. Uh, these are exports that are rapidly ceasing to find uh, credulous customers. Uh, instead of having a trade policy that serves America, we have a trade policy that serves, once again, financial elites. Uh, the banks don't mind if we go into hock to the tune of 6 or 7 percent of GDP every year, as long as they can get in on the action. And there's a three-way link between bad financial practices, bad trade policy, and sinking wages. That is an economy based on unsustainable debt. Now, you would think that all of this would be the prime subject of political debate. Uh, but it isn't. And uh, one of the things that gives me some hope is that all six Democrats who took back seats in the 2006 midterm rejected the advice to scuttle to the center, uh, and they ran as economic populists, and they spoke, <clears throat> they spoke to the lived lives of ordinary people, and they won in places that Democrats don't ordinarily win. I hope we get uh, that kind of courage and leadership and wisdom from the next president. Whether we do or not uh, is up to us. Uh, because it will take nothing less than a transformative presidency to fix what's broken. If we don't have a transformative presidency, we will have a failed presidency. This is one of those moments when you have to be a radical to be an effective liberal. You may remember when one of Ronald Reagan's speechwriters uh, discovered what was purported to be a, a Russian proverb 
uh, trust but verify. And uh, Reagan, who was delighted by this, took to quoting the proverb in his speeches and even uh, lecturing Gorbachev in Hollywood Russian, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, uh, dovryai no proverdyai. I would say to all of us who so eagerly, eagerly want a, a transformative president, hope but verify. Because the next president will be overwhelmed by an undertow of bad advice and institutional influence, the dead hand of a failed 30-year experiment. The next president needs us not just to win the election, to pre but to prevent the next administration's capture uh, by the usual suspects. Think about it. 30 years of declining living standards uh, was not enough to provoke a political counter-revolution. It took a collapse on Wall Street. Um, now, in my remaining two minutes, um, what do I think we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to re-regulate financial markets so that we can get the kind of broad prosperity that we had in the post-war era, where the economy not only grew at 4% a year, but the economy became more equal. In that era, we could have 2% real interest rates because uh, financial regulation meant that that money could not be squandered on speculation. It had to be invested in the real economy. If Bernanke keeps lowering rates and the low interest rates are just used to inflate more financial bubbles, we'll just get more of the same. Secondly, we need to spend so much more federal money than any of the candidates are willing to talk about because we need that money to rebuild infrastructure, to create uh, energy independence and a clean economy, and to create jobs that pay decent wages. We need to restore an economy that works for working people. I've proposed uh, a national program so that every human service job would be a good job a kind of Davis-Bacon for service workers. And uh, all it takes is money. You know, and when George W. Bush wanted to invade Iraq, money was no obstacle. When George W. Bush wanted to give tax cuts to the wealthy, money was no obstacle. We shouldn't be talking about a $150 billion stimulus package. We should be talking more about six or seven or $800 billion of public outlay to restore uh, an equitable economy. <laughs> And we can finance that by getting out of Iraq, and we can finance it by restoring progressive taxation. Now, I don't have to remind you, <clears throat> don't have to remind you that all of these proposals are at the very fringes of mainstream debate, uh, and it's our task to make them mainstream. So the first job of a new president is to transform public opinion in a way that we haven't seen since LBJ's civil rights days and Roosevelt's attack on economic royalists. And before the nominee can do that, the nominee needs his or her own transformation. Everybody in this room needs to be part of that process. So thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for not giving up on American democracy. Together, we can take back America. Thank you, Bob Kuttner. I now have the honor of uh, introducing the President of the Communication Workers of America. Larry Cohen is one of the most visionary and effective leaders in the labor movement, and he believes in organizing. Organizing as a way to bring labor rights and middle class incomes and benefits to working families. Uh, as chair of the AFL-CIO's organizing committee, Larry is a fierce advocate for the Employee Free Choice Act. And he has demonstrated again and again, when workers have the right to work rights on a job, they're also the strongest force for a progressive political democracy dedicated to prosperity for all. President Cohen is a founder of our TBA partner, Jobs with Justice. He's also made the communications workers a leader of large-scale strategic campaigns that target corporations and take on big policy initiatives. So for example, he is mobilizing the CWA membership to push healthcare for all and will be working closely with the new healthcare coalition. 
please welcome CWA President Larry Cohen. Thank you. Okay, I don't know about Andrea, but each one of these you cross off more of your own remarks, right? So this will get shorter and shorter. Anyway, um, great to be here uh, among allies. And on the one hand, as, as Bob and Jack both pointed out, we're here at a really tough time. Uh, we can look at the crisis in many ways, the fifth anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, the worst credit crunch since the Great Depression, uh, the worst trade deficit that any country has had ever, the highest foreclosure rate in decades, a dollar at record lows, oil and other commodities at record highs, and workers' rights at the very bottom of any economic democracy, a health care crisis for most Americans, and a presidential candidate on the Republican side who, when he was asked recently about what to do about Iran, he comes up, strides up, and says, well, I want to paraphrase the Beach Boys, bomb, 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 Iran, and he's saying it a little better than that. It's not really funny, but you think about what we face and then what we face in terms of the election in November and the difference between that candidate and the two Democratic candidates. Well, for those of us in labor, uh, we're focused really on four key issues, and I'm going to focus mostly on the one. Uh, Jack has already talked about, um, here goes my card. Uh, Jack has already talked about uh, trade, and we could spend uh, you know, all of our time talking about what's happened to the global economy, where workers stand around the world in that global economy, versus where uh, Bear Stearns and the others that are plundering uh, our own economy stand and what they tell us. And again, think about John McCain. He's never met a trade deal he doesn't like. He boasts about the fact that we should sign the Columbia Free Trade Agreement. And I wear a bracelet around my wrist, I was there a month ago, of a teachers union leader who was murdered in Colombia, uh, one of hundreds of women that were murdered among the 2,574 unionists that were murdered there. And when President Bush or John McCain says, pass the free trade agreement, everyone in this room, whether you come from a union or not, should think of those unionists and progressives murdered in Colombia and say, no way, not on our watch. We know what fair trade is, and we know that that's not fair trade. And there'll be a lot of talk at this conference about health care. And as Roger just said, our union is in the midst of a major uh, campaign mobilizing across our union, including retirees, uh, trying to mobilize to force our employers uh, to be, as we say, off our backs and on our sides. Because every one of our employers, where well, we've negotiated relatively decent health care in the private sector, but even in the public sector, every time we come to the bargaining table, it's cut, cut, cut. And here we are still, although a few more days like today, we won't still be the richest country in the world, and we have among the worst health care in terms of access, in terms of inflated costs, and in terms of the fear that millions and millions of Americans have that they'll be sick and won't be able to figure out what to do about it. But really, uh, in my minutes here, I want to focus on, as Roger said, the Employee Free Choice Act. And we gave out a couple of handouts. I don't think they all made it to everybody. But uh, one of them is a bar chart. And again, think about the global economy. And what this shows is where the U.S. ranks, and you should all have these, where the U.S. ranks compared to every other industrial democracy. And there we are in red, the lowest, that 12 percent of American workers have bargaining coverage. 12 percent. And you see all the other countries, including new newly emerged democracies like South Africa, at 42 percent. Under apartheid, it was under 10 percent. You see Brazil at 36 percent. Twenty years ago, they had a military dictatorship, and it was under 15 percent. And so, and you see, obviously, Europe and Canada, as Jack well knows, at 32 percent. And in fact, much of the differences, as Jack would be the first to say, between Canada and the U.S. on policy questions that everyone in this room cares about, like health care, has to do with the fact that almost three times as many workers in Canada have collective bargaining coverage have the ability to belong to a union, have the ability to negotiate and build their political movement off of that base as we do here in the United States. So uh, again, in the interest of time, I want to really crunch on this card and ask for your help. This card is about the million member mobilization that we've launched to pass the Employee Free Choice Act. Last year, early at the, at the beginning of that Congress, Speaker Pelosi left her podium and went to the floor 
to talk about the critical nature of the Employee Free Choice Act, not just for unions, but to bring back the middle class in this country. And she left that podium to say that wherever you are in this country, whether you're union or not, we understand what the role is of collective bargaining for Americans in bringing back the middle class. We can't legislate one policy issue after another. But when workers have unions, and when workers have a real voice on the job, and when workers build an organization of their own, they can change, we can change our own lives, and we can also unite with all of you to change America. That's what the Employee Free Choice Act is about. Now, when I met with George Miller, on behalf of the AFL-CIO and, and really the change to win unions as well in January to say, okay, last year we passed that overwhelmingly in the House, George, with your leadership, and in the Senate we had a majority but couldn't get past the filibuster, and obviously we would have had a presidential veto even if we had. And so what do we do? And he says, he was sort of coughing, he had the flu like everybody else, he gets up out of his chair, and you know, there's no audience here, it was three of us, gets up out of his chair and he says, Larry, Give me any Democratic president and this speaker, and we're going to enact this bill. And now what I need you to do is to mobilize at least a million members across this country so that this is not a test next year between their lobby, the corporate lobby, who will spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, to stop this, and, and the so-called labor lobby. This needs to be about millions of Americans that are standing up. So that's why this is called the Million Member Mobilization. And what George asked for, actually, is that in as many cases as possible, we not only get our members to sign up, but to put their picture on the back so we see the faces of America standing up to fight for the middle class, standing up to fight not only for their own bargaining rights, but for millions of Americans who can't get bargaining rights on the job. So what we want each, each person here to do is not only sign this, but like what we're asking every local union to do in my union, and two of we have local leaders here from across the country, including Iowa and Nebraska, and I just talked to them and said, listen, you've got to make sure, uh, Steve and Lloyd, that in your locals, in Omaha and Waterloo, that you help lead this fight to get at least 10 percent of the members to sign up, slap their picture on the back, and send it in. And so the rest of us in this room who are allies in this fight, we need you to do exactly the same thing. Not only fill this out today, and, and folks will be collecting these on the way out, but to help us make this link between bargaining rights in this country and all the other things we stand for, particularly building the kind of political movement that will change this country, that will take back this country. And for us in labor, we cannot do this ourselves. We need this to be an issue for all of progressive America, to understand the difference between the United States and every one of these countries, and to realize that this is not inevitable that unions will become extinct and that bargaining will go away in this country. In Brazil, they fought back and they've raised up bargaining. In South Africa, they fought back. In prior generations in this country, we were at 8% before in 1935, and people fought back and built a political movement, and more than a million workers a year organized. So if each of us in this room imagines what it can be like a year from now, what it, what it can be like on each of the issues that brought us here today, and if we imagine what it can be like to win back bargaining rights, so when this Speaker Pelosi takes the floor next year to support this bill, it'll be a year when we can get it through the Senate, where we have a president who will fight for this bill if we don't have 60 votes in the Senate, where we have a president who will campaign for universal health care, where we have a president who will understand what fair trade means and what kind of economy, as Bob just told us, that we can build together. And if we all imagine that, and if we all say to the two Democratic candidates, stop the fighting between you, when we say which side are you on, it's John McCain's side or our side. There's not three sides, there's two sides. We know which side we're on. We're here fighting for economic justice. We're here fighting to end the war in Iraq. We're here fighting for health care for all. We're here to fight for workers' rights. Together we'll win that fight, and we'll win that fight together. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Cohen. Uh, we progressives have driven the debate about the big issues in this election year, from health care to the Iraq war, from investing in green jobs and healthy growth 
to exposing the financial deregulation that led to the housing crisis. And every year at Take Back America, it seems, we learn new lessons from Andrea Batista Schlesinger about how to talk about those big issues in a way that means something to struggling middle class and working class families. Since 2002, Andrea has made the New York-based Drum Major Institute a public policy think tank with national impact and grassroots usefulness. They have done research on the middle class squeeze and each year they rate Congress on votes that either help or hurt the middle class and those trying to climb into the middle class. Andrea has stood up to Lou Dobbs on immigration and that frustrating CNN show. And I would imagine she will be very influential with the new governor of New York and we hope with the new president of the United States. Please welcome a drum major for justice, Andrea Batista Schlesinger. He had to bring up the Lou Dobbs thing. I was finally getting over that. Um, so Larry mentioned crossing things off. So now that Larry spoke, this is what I'm, this is what, this is what I'm left with. I'm going to try my best. So I'm from New York. But lately, that seems to be a punchline. Um, so I'm just relieved that we're doing the event at this hotel. Um, and. But I do want to share some, some lessons from my home state that have absolutely nothing to do with wire transfers or, or crossing state lines. Um, it's such a clean crowd. Not, do any of you even know what I'm... Okay. And do you read the New York Post or the Daily News? Or watch Fox? Um, in New York, we were all so tired of the Republican Pataki administration, the passivity the refusal to acknowledge the increasing insecurity of New Yorkers, the dysfunction of Albany, our state capital, in which business was done behind closed doors, if at all. We had an upstate that was essentially a manifestation of, of our changing economy, uh, a New York City plagued by profound income inequality, an increasing number of middle class families who could no longer afford to live in their own city. So we elected someone whose slogan was change on day one. No, no, that's not, my joke is the next line, so hold on. Um, but what we didn't anticipate, all of us, was that what was more important than day one was day two. Before we knew it, before we could even blink, our former governor was resisting progressive taxation, aligning himself with the tort reformers who think that the cost of health care is going up because too many people who are the victims of, of, of negligence or malpractice want to sue, um, rather than the insurance industry heads who are getting richer and richer. He was announcing proposals like giving people driver's license regardless of their citizenship, which is a good idea, an important idea, has to be done, but doing so without any of the base building that could have turned that idea into reality. When it comes to building an economy that works for working people in our country, what happens on November 5th is more important than what happens on November 4th, especially if we elect a Democrat to office. Who will set the tone of the debate? There's a profound squeeze. The other speakers have detailed it well. A profound middle class squeeze. Essential questions of power, of government versus corporations, in which it's clear everywhere from our bankruptcy policy to our trade policy to even our higher education policy that corporations have won. But who will set the tone? Will we be talking about retraining programs as a solution? School uniforms as if that could deal with our profound and the profound inadequacy of our public education system? Targeted tax credits as if targeted tax credits could solve our problems? Or will we be talking about how to strengthen the labor movement that built America's middle class? I th I, that was for Larry because I, um, are we going to be talking about how to pass an immigration policy that doesn't start with fences so that even Democrats can convince Lou Dobbs that we're tough enough? 
as too many Democrats have been doing, or are we gonna start with the recognition that the longer immigrants labor in the shadows with no rights, all working Americans are vulnerable? Are we going to give the federal government the ability to actually negotiate down the cost of prescription drugs? Are we gonna stop passing these trade mills, of trade bills that continue to undermine American workers? You know, how many Democrats voted, do you know, if you're local, member of Cong Congress voted for this Peru trade deal? They say, they say the, do you know? Do we know? They say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. <laughs> that is nowhere more true than on this Peru trade bill where everybody who voted for it also laments the downward spiral of American workers and our immigration crisis and continues to vote for the bills that put us in this position. On the elevator on the way down here, I met people who were at the conference before this, and that was an association of psychotherapists. <laughs> and I thought, there's got to be some kind of uh, sy symbolic value uh, in this fact, perhaps a joint caucus uh, um, that, that, that we could put together. Are we going to stop passing diluted energy and tax bills? Are we going to tax hedge funds the way they ought to be taxed and tell corporate America that we no longer buy their line, that greedy lawyers and too many lawsuits are the problem? You know, the president was talking about in his last State of the Union address the importance of volunteerism, and I agree. But I don't think that volunteerism um, should apply to the banking sector. Um, are we actually going to have a president who's going to eliminate all forms of abusive lending practices and give judges uh, the ability to renegotiate mortgages, reform our bankruptcy laws? If we're going to set things right, we need to lay out a bold economic agenda, and we need to stick to it. And we can't be fooled because the piddling moderates are going to come in on November 5th and they're going to advance their agenda of tax credits and school uniforms because that's what they think Americans want. We need to get smart about what the president can do. We need to get smart about what's on the table of Congress. And remember, there are 470 elections that are taking place that first Tuesday, not just one. And unfortunately, not every member of the House who is up for election is Donna Edwards. So we need to get smart about what members of Congress are up to. And we need to look to places to where, where progressive agenda is actually being advanced. You know, we have these debates up here about is a progressive ideology best for people, conservative ideology, is government good, is government bad? The best way to have that debate is to actually highlight where government is working. There are people in San Francisco who now have paid sick leave. There are people, workers in New Jersey, who are soon going to have paid family leave. There are states and cities that are actually pioneering solutions to climate change. We need to get those stories down because even if, as progressives like New Yorkers, we are inclined to be negative, the truth is, and we have good reason, as I started with, um, the truth is that it is those success stories that will actually help us advance a progressive agenda, not just a critique of a conservative ideology. But to do this, I think we're going to have to broaden our understanding of shared economic interest. And I say this with all due respect to the labor movement, they are going to have to be as concerned about progressive taxation and making that a litmus test for their endorsements as they are for the Employee Free Choice Act. And immigrant rights groups are going to have to march as strongly as they would around the Employee Free Choice Act. Uh, as they would around comprehensive immigration reform. We are all going to have to think of our interests more broadly. <laughs> Ultimately, I'm going to take the train back to New York with my head held up high. <laughs> because thanks to the Mann Act, and if you don't know what that is and you think you might want to know, you should research it. Um, in New York, we've been given a do-over. But unfortunately, with our country, we're not going to have that chance. So all of us need to be thinking as much about November 5th as we do about November 4th. Thank you. OK, well, this has been a terrific panel. I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, I also. People noted that Donna Edwards, almost member of Congress, is in the audience. I also want to acknowledge Jan Schakowsky, a role model for all these new <laughs> members of Congress who is in the audience. So 
Thank you, Jack Layton. Thank you, Robert Kuttner. Thank you, Larry Cohen. Thank you, Andrea Batista Schlesinger, for a very, very provocative discussion of the economic challenges that face our country. Thanks very much. Now it's on to uh, the breakout sessions.